Yes, welcome everybody to the University of the Highlands and Islands Archaeology Institute's monthly seminar series. Um, and today's speakers are Emily Gall and Rebecca Rennell, who are from the uh, UHI at uh, Lewis Castle College. Uh, and they've had a really exciting project going on this summer. Uh, about using augmented reality. So it's called the US Virtual Archaeology Project um, and launched um, the US Unearthed app in July, um, which is a really innovative and exciting way of using archaeology and presenting archaeology. Uh, so we're really looking forward to hearing all about this. The floor is yours, Emily and Becky. Thank you so much, Becky, and um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting us to come and talk today. Uh, really, really excited to tell you all about um, about this project. Um, so, as I already said, my name is Becky Rennell. I'm uh, based at Lewis Castle College um, in we're at the Learning Centre in Lewis, um, part of UHI, and I'm the UVAC project manager. And with me is Emily Gal, who's the UVAC project coordinator. And so today I'm going to start off just explaining a little bit of the rationale behind this project, where the ideas came from and, and how we got to uh, got to where we are today. And then I think I'll hand over to Emily, who'll tell you about all the exciting things that we've done since we started. Um, so just in case there's anyone out there, I'm sure there isn't anyone who doesn't know where US is, but just in case, um, this is this is where we are. Um, this is the chain of islands where we're based and where we work and where our, our app and our project is about. Um, so really the starting point for this whole project uh, has to be that US is home to really significant archaeological heritage um, of local, national and international significance. Um, we could have picked any number of photos really to demonstrate that, but I've chosen here to, to show the Barco Angus, which is one of our uh, scheduled monuments. Uh, Neolithic Chamber Tomb with lots of uh, important archaeologists. You'll know who you are. I'm sure lots of people will recognise themselves in this photo. Um, but also the site of Halland, which is uh, Cook Halland uh, in South Uis, which is one of the sites we feature in our app. Uh, so the, the point being, Uis has really significant archaeological heritage. Um, but not only that, uh, many of our fantastic archaeological sites in Uis are exceptionally well researched, and they've been really, really widely published. And here's just a, a few examples of some of the, the great work that's been done. Um, a really long history of excavation, uh, in particular the search project, um, and again, lots of the, the publications here relate to that. Uh, well, actually, sorry, in fact, all of the publications uh, relate to that. Um, decades of really exceptional archaeological research, all um, represented by this work here. But despite that, despite our amazing archaeological sites and all this exceptional research, I think it's still fair to say that um, our archaeological resources remain quite poorly understood um, by the wider community. Um, uh, visitors, people who are based here in Uist, uh, um, but the wider kind of archaeological community as well sometimes. So to date, I think we feel very strongly that the archaeological resource hasn't, resource hasn't been exploited enough in terms of community benefits, um, visitor experiences and really its potential to contribute to economic growth in the island. So one of the things that um, is worth pointing out that at the last visitor survey is only 7% of visitors to uh, the Western Isles, and that's not even broken down specifically to US, but the Western Isles as a whole, only 7% of those visitors cited archaeology as one of the reasons for visiting. Um, so really, we feel that there's been this huge potential, despite this huge potential, there's been a real failure to realise this potential for the communities in terms of sharing some of these amazing stories, enriching people's experiences and enhancing the local economy. So that was our sort of starting point. And in order to work out how we might address these, we needed to look a bit more closely at some of the challenges. So one of the challenges is really around accessibility. Um, a lot of our archaeological sites remain quite inaccessible to um, the wider public. Um, many of our archaeological sites remain buried within the Macha with very little to see, apart from sort of lumps and bumps. And there on the right, we've got a slide of uh, Udo Macha, um, just, a, just one of many, many examples we could pick about really internationally significant archaeology that um, appears just as a, a small rise in, in the landscape. 
Um, and our other important sites, lots of them are located on small islets out in the moorland in really difficult to get to places. Um, and here we've got an example being Torkel, Doon Torkel, a, a fantastic rock site in North Uris. Again, we could have picked many others just to highlight those accessibility issues. Um, but also, we, we don't have masses of infrastructure in the islands around heritage tourism. Um, only a handful of our sites here are furnished with any form of interpretation. Callan is, in fact, one of them that has an a information panel. And there's really minimal signposting. Um, uh, the other slides we've got up here showing someone uh, last summer camping in the middle of the, one of the roundhouses, just as evidence that people didn't really know what they were looking at and didn't realise the significance of the site that they put their tent up in the middle of. Um, and also this fantastic signage uh, doing talk for, which is, um, relates to a particular period of interpretation. Uh, quite, quite um, outdated, I think, in some ways, but a lovely, lovely bit of archaeology of archaeology. Um, another challenge that we have here are really fragile landscapes. Um, a lot of the sites um, are located in landscapes that have uh, erosion issues, and these have challenges for developing access and also for associated visitor interpretation facilities. You can see on the right there, there's a signage uh, for the Hebridean Way that's just falling out of the dune into the sea, um, and also a picture of one of our many uh, eroding living sites. So these are all the kind of challenges that we have. Um, and sometimes it's easy to just get a bit focused on those. But actually, what we've done with this project um, is really turn this on, it on its head and try and reimagine and revisualize lots of these challenges and opportunities. Um, and I think the thing that we can often get stuck on here in the Western Isles is that we don't have um, many of the kind of upstanding archaeological remains that are synonymous with places like Orkney, for example. And lots of people sitting waiting for when are we going to find our next, when are we going to find a scar or grey? And actually what the starting point really for us was going, well, we just need to recognise that our archaeology looks really different from places like or Orkney. Um, what we do have are really rich archaeological landscapes. We've got incredible preservation on the Macca and on the moorland. Um, but lots of our remains are buried, and that um, opportunity is around discovery. Um, and that we've also got these exceptional details from decades and decades of top quality archaeological investigations. And therefore, we've got these really interesting, internationally significant stories to tell. So the challenge is how do we convey this rich story of the past that's a lot of it buried, is inaccessible, and has these kind of challenges around fragile landscapes? Um, how do we go about bringing this uh, to a wider audience? And this is where we've been forced to look to technology and innovative and creative solutions to that. And that led us to this, which is US Virtual Archaeology Project. Um, I've already said that the project's led by myself and Emily, but we should also mention Jake Clark, who's our project researcher, who can't be here with us today, but um, who works with us here in Newest. Uh, the project is also a partnership with Corlia, um, the Western Arts Council, um, and is funded by Nature Scott's uh, Natural and Cultural Heritage Fund, also by National Lottery Heritage Fund, uh, CNES, and Spora Zurst. Um, our funders have lots of interest in heritage, but also um, more specifically heritage within fragile landscapes and interest in environments. And this really reflects some of the core themes of our, of our project. We work with developers um, called Peel Interactive. And what we've done so far with this project is we've created a Uist on Earth app. And this is a cross-platform mobile app. It will contain um, AR reconstructions of seven archaeological sites. Um, at the moment, we've launched just one of those um, that we're going to be talking about in a bit. Um, but there will be seven archaeological sites all located on the Hebridean Way through Uist and Benbecula. Um, this, over the next two years, is going to be complemented by a mixed media exhibition that will be, one of which will be stationed uh, sort of semi-permanently here in Uist, and another one which will travel out with Uist and will allow us to sort of shine a light on some of our archaeology here. Um, and as I think Maggie also noted, we've, we've launched this first site in July already. And the first site we launched was um, the Colcallan site. Uh, so on this slide here, we're just showing you that interface um, uh, of our app. One thing that I think Emily will talk about in a little bit more detail, but it's worth just making this point in the beginning, is that almost all of the functionality of our app, you can only really engage with once you're at the site. And the point being that we want people to engage with these landscapes and places. Um, 
the, uh, slide, the picture on the right shows you there the Hebridean Way and where our sites are located on it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about Hallam and why we picked this one as our starting point, then I'm going to hand over to you. Is that good? Great. Okay, so Hallam is, is one of our internationally significant sites in US. It's the story if I'm really trying to sell archaeology to local school groups, um, if I'm trying to get um, sort of just, I don't know, visiting family members who are sick of being, you know, dragged around to look at part of stone, this is the site that I always want to talk about because it's just so exciting. Um, the site's located on the west coast of South Uist, on the map at Dalabra, um, and as you can see, uh, these pictures here show how it looks today. There are some information panels there, um, but really what you have is a kind of a little bit of stonework and these sort of dips in the ground. The site was excavated by University of Sheffield between 1989 and 2003, um, and what their excavations revealed were three conjoined Bronze Age roundhouses, constructed uh, around 1500 BC. Uh, Hallam was then shown to be part of a much wider settled landscape, and there were extensive excavations um, at this site over that period. Those of you, uh, the archaeologists amongst the audience, will be very familiar, I'm sure, with some of these photographs. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Emily, who's going to talk about how we've then taken this information from these sites um, and this on the ground, not terribly inspiring, to hopefully something that conveys the, the wonders of this site to our audience. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take over and just sort of uh, take some of that and contextualise it within the app and, and talk about how we've addressed some of these challenges uh, using that digital technology. And we argue, as, as Becky mentioned, that these sites are best understood within their landscapes. And the key aim of ours is then to be encouraging engagement with the place throughout the course of this project. And as a result, as Becky said, users can only trigger the augmented reconstructions, the augmented reality reconstructions of the settlement at, at the Hallam as it might have looked around three and a half thousand years ago when they reached the site itself and scan the QR code that you can see here, which is embedded in our logo. Uh, and, then, and then that brings up this fantastic reconstruction. And I'll talk about um, AR in the next slide and what exactly that means for those who aren't that familiar. But essentially, it was just really important to us that these heritage assets cannot just be accessed from anywhere. The point is to get people out into US landscapes, engaging with place, engaging with these sites directly. Using augmented reality, the app reveals sites that are buried or otherwise quite inaccessible on numerous, um, in numerous ways, whether that's conceptually or, or physically. Uh, and, and with this location triggered technology, where you can only trigger these reconstructions here and, and, the align, and they align directly where the houses would have been. Uh, and, and the use of mixed media, including audio visual elements and, and various presentations of archaeological data within that. These elements combine to create this truly unique offering in the heritage interpretation field so far, which is really exciting. And this is an example of, of what the what you see. This is a, taken directly from the app. That's not a, a Photoshop or anything. That's just a photo took of, of another of, a, of another screen. And this is an example of augmented reality for those who aren't familiar. So essentially, unlike virtual reality, where you're completely immersed in your environment. So, for example, with a with a headset, which you're probably quite familiar with. Uh, augmented reality it keeps your, your environment as it is around you, but it's then pasting essentially a filter or something, some new content on top of your existing environment and augmenting it in that way. And classic examples more widely known in, in popular culture, things like Pokemon Go, for example, or, or, or filters, any filter that you put on your face um, on, on various social media platforms. So this is us essentially using that technology. Uh, and applying it to the Bronze Age. So this, this is a reconstruction of how the, the site at Kakal and these three joined roundhouses might have looked when they were occupied using the archaeological data. And that's been a really key opportunity here, is to create some really innovative and diverse presentations of complex and often quite inaccessible archaeological data that's, that's in these it's really uh, well-written and, and really hugely detailed monographs but mining those monographs and taking that out and presenting it in, 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 the, in a more visual way. And we've presented stories from Clachallan uh, through a variety of media and layered this information to try and pick up the broadest audience possible of our interest. And that's been a really exciting opportunity to have. And this is how most of our sessions started to look. As, as COVID hit, it was lots of poring over various reconstructions, various iterations of reconstructions. Uh, with ourselves as the team, with our project researcher, with our fantastic app developers, our 3D modelers, also the excavators of the site as well. So a truly collaborative process there to make sense of this fantastic site. And really key to that then has been this collaborative working 
it was all achieved by this, this really creative and collaborative workflow managed by ourselves as archaeologists, but we also worked really closely with the excavators, who might Mike Parker Pearson there on the left, getting to grips with the augmented reality, um, and, and the developers, but also our various community stakeholders as well, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly. And we really tightly managed that creative process from an archaeological perspective, which has been both really rewarding, but also quite challenging, I think, and we were fondly dubbed by our developers as, as micromanaging the, the, the sort of the, the way in which we are presenting the data, because we just have some really clear ideas on, on how it should be told, as well as taking into account various opinions on that from our stakeholders as well. And this is just how another example of how that that workflows worked. This is this is uh, a, a little storyboard created by our project researcher Jake as, as all of us are trying to get get to grips with the story of the the mummification of the human remains at Clachala, which is again a very a famous, very well known story with the composite bodies and the, the preserved bodies at Hallen, and one of the main uh, kind of draws and the main exciting stories that you'll probably be very familiar about. Uh, about Clackallan, but us trying to work through that story as archaeologists and then present that in, in an engaging way, in a way that made sense to us, uh, because it's, it's a very complex um, archaeological story. And before I, I go into some of the, the media, I wanted to start by talking about what, what has been really important to this project, which is the use of Gaelic. So there was a real important opportunity here to embed Gaelic language in a sensitive, but also really innovative way throughout the art. As the language of the region, Gaelic has a really fun, fundamental role to play in effective interpretation of archaeological landscapes, and that's something we really wanted to explore as much as possible. And to achieve that, we've worked with Kios Uisht, a Eurostate uh, Gaelic arts organisation. And we, we've got uh, the entire app is bilingual, all the content is bilingual, a standard, and, it, and it's written in such a way that it's not just a verbatim translation, we wanted it to make sense in Gaelic as, as much as possible. Uh, but in, to ensure as well that this, this heritage interpretation goes beyond verbatim translation, we've also commissioned additional bespoke Gaelic content which reflects on aspects of place, landscape and culture through stories, poetry and song from tradition bearers, reporters and many others as well. I'm just wanting now to go through some of these varying presentations of archaeological data and the various mixed media we've used to tell some of the stories from this Bronze Age site. And this is just one example. So, so we use these, these really high definition um, or augmented reality models of the houses. This is what you see when you look through the app. Uh, at first, it triggers this, this model where you can't really tell that it's life size. So that's directly in proportion with the landscape. So you can go inside those houses, you can duck under the doors and you can explore inside the houses. And you can see here these little blue circles, all of those are trigger points. So each time you press one of those, you get further information and that's, that can be uh, various different uh, aspects of information, different stories that we uh, have told about Clark Allen. So this is just one example. This is the 3D model, uh, the more the classic way in which we, we've kind of used some of the data uh, of the houses, but we made the decision here not to people it. So we haven't got Bronze Age people sort of sitting around uh, for, for various reasons that we've maybe talked about in the discussion. Uh, we've made the decision not to animal it as well, if you like, so there's no Bronze Age cows because there are cows on the map already. And by using this app, your people in that site again yourself very distinct decision we made there. But also we've used more illustrative styles as well. So using some more creative and, and sort of what we feel are more engaging ways of telling the story. This is a screenshot of an, uh, an animation that the, the developers created, the fantastic animator Rachel, which tells the story of the mummified and composite bodies from Clark Allen. And the animation takes a really complex story. They can see a storyboarding in, in, the, in the previous slides. And sets it out and what we hope is, is a clear way to understand what's, what's a lot of very, very complicated uh, phasings and, and different things happening all at the same time. Uh, and it's been really nice to, to show that to school groups, for example, and then hearing them after pre seeing that story, that really hugely complicated story with lots of different archaeological processes going on there and communicating that and, and just summarizing it in a really clear way. So clear evidence there of learning and understanding uh, and, and being able to memorize and, and remember that story. And it also gave us an opportunity here to explore the, the sensitive portrayal of human remains as well, quite a hot topic just now, and something that's particularly relevant to Hallen and how we choose to present the information gathered from Hallen. It's very near to a, a, a working a new cemetery. Um, so, the, so the sensitivities there about how we choose to portray something that was happening around three and a half thousand years ago in, in a similar location. So it gave us a chance to explore some of those stories in a way that you can elect to see it if you'd like, but also if you 
so you don't have to. And also what we're implementing, which is quite nice in, in the next um, in the next situation of the app is this feedback um, section, this feedback tool, which allows you to, to tell us what you think this all meant about the story, because there are no firm answers, there's as many aspects of prehistory, and we wanted to recognise the sort of the multivocality of that and, and the fact that there, there could be lots of interpretations and away slightly from that authoritative voice and, and try and, and get some more opinions on why that is, because some of the best ideas and the best opinions we have are from visitors while they're using the app and the testing from school children, et cetera, et cetera. And that will then feed into the mixed media exhibition as well. And just a couple of other examples of, of some of the media and, and techniques we've employed. We've got photographs and, and text, so the fairly traditional ways in which we, we tell a story of sites within the app, but then also we've got infographics um, and, and, and various illustrations as well to tell the story of, for example, the composite mummies, so the, the rich place name history that we've got for, for all of our sites, indeed, not just Howard. Here's another example, the, the use of illustration and, and the more um, illustrative style of understanding the really complex phasing at Halland from, from it. It's a very long lived site spanning the Bronze Age and the Iron Age uh, and being able to commission this series of illustrations telling the story of Halland at various points in its, in its life and the different ways in which it functioned. It was used so before it was a settlement, for example, when it was a cremation cemetery, having that, that opportunity has been really, really exciting. But also going back to the more traditional uh, 3D modeling of, of various objects as well. We've got the, the gold plated um, sheet um, granular ring that's found in the, the way of the northernmost house uh, and, and the little uh, model of a deposit there. So one of the structure, the, one of the many structure depositions that we have in the floor of, of the Harlem roundhouses was this Bronze Age pot with a scapula, just pebbles and uh, a scallop shaft. Additional uh, use of 3D modeling there as well. I'd like to just sort of touch on Bornish then as well, before we, we talk about some of the presentations that we've used there. The Bornish is the site, this is kind of a sneak peek, really, not many people have seen this, it's a bit of an exclusive, but we're working on Bornish as we speak. Bornish uh, is, is a, it's a Norse site, one of the largest and most important Norse and Viking settlement and trading sites in Scotland, excavated by Cardiff University between 1996. And 2004. So, again, really extensive and fantastic excavations uh, and, and really important publications that have come out of this that we have now the, the opportunity to, to take, take from and to, to communicate that in a different way. And, and uh, it's a series of three longhouses and some other structures as well, beginning around AD 900 for, for this particular place that we're looking at and ending around AD 1300, but some Iron Age origins there as well with the wheelhouse. So a really important site and that's what it looks like today there on the right hand side uh, and as, as Becky talked about this is how the majority of our marker sites actually tend to look it's just the, these sort of three low rises in the landscape they're not particularly uh, imposing and again like like Hallen it's got an interpretation board this one's a slightly better nick the ones at Hallen we're up on a, a series of posts uh, they've since been knocked down by cows but they are still there so they're, they're still uh, readable but they're quite faded We've got this, this lovely interpretation board here, more traditional interpretation board with the, the wall of the English text and the wall of Gaelic and a lovely illustration in the middle. Uh, but what's particularly challenging about this site and its interpretation is that this is the location of the interpretation board and this is where the site actually is. It looks quite close, but it's in fact, I'd say about a 10 minute walk at least to the actual site. So when you're standing and looking at that board, you might think, well, where is it? As, as I did before I realised where it was. Uh, and it's because it's actually 10 minutes over that way. So it's, it's not uh, easy to, to actually envisage that, that site. And that's the reason for that is, is it's about land use and about, uh, using the land just now, if it makes sense, but it presents a, an opportunity here because again, it's right on Hebridean Way. And I think that's a really important point to mention. I can't mention it, maybe we're good, but all of these sites, they're located along the Hebridean Way. So we're enhancing that, that tourist and visitor infrastructure that we already have here in US. So they're all located on, on the Hebridean Way. So there's a, that existing, offering, we're just enhancing that and adding that, get people to just use it for a little bit longer. And again, using a, a variety of different presentations of the archaeological data here. This is an illustration of the co-making workshop at Bornish. Again, using all that fantastic archaeological data gathered by the excavations during the search project uh, and, and transforming that in, into this, so all based on our archaeological evidence. 
and again the the, the interior and what's been really nice about working on, on things like this the interiors we've been able to, to look at um the, the black houses and, and different roofs of, of structures that we still have here in years now and being able to, to think about how they would have worked and, and whether they present some analog that we can then use to, to reconstruct the roofs we know there's a lot of driftwood being used at Bornish and indeed lots of the other sites in the Western Isles uh, so, so making that look quite gnarled and having lots of nice um, sensations to be able to draw on has been really valuable. And again, that's just an example of it in progress. It's actually changed quite a lot again since that since that initial uh, that initial process. But it's been really nice and it's been really useful, I think, for us as archaeologists. I think it's got some really important research implications for uh, how we how we think we understand the use of space in these structures. And then when you're actually put inside a 3D version of that. It's definitely challenged a lot of my preconceptions about how we use space and how I think that people use space. So it's, it's got important implications for that as well. And this is a, a, an, an animation that we've got. It's supposed to play sound. We can't work out how to make the sound play. So just imagine some really atmospheric sounds, but just another example of how we've, um, yeah, how we've used, we can hear it if I don't think it up. There, there won't be any sound, but imagine the sound. It's just another play, way of presenting some of that update. And the cylinder, kind of Cornish, will be suspended with the uh, breathing equipment, potentially. It's sort of making a little ring a ring. Perhaps we can, we'll, we'll be able to share that at some point with the sound as well. So the sound really makes it, but um, you'll just have to imagine it. I'm going to play it again. I don't know if it's not playing. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, yeah, so just to recap on the use of mixed media, then this is the list of the different media we've we've explored and used within the app from the more traditional 3D models of buildings, then presented in that augmented reality, these life size augmented reality models, future animation and illustration, audio, uh, photographs, uh, 3D models of artifacts, infographics, text, and interactive games. So there's lots of different layers to that. And we, we, what we've also done is implemented something called what we call Dig Deeper, so that if you do want to to find even more information, because we had some testers saying, I want more, we've got uh, various ways in which you can then find the, the more information if you desire it beyond using this, this app at the site as well. Collaborating and co-production of content has been a really important aspiration and activity for this project and various restrictions in place over the last couple of years has meant we weren't able to carry out the in-person content creation workshops we planned for um, for Hallam, but something we're now pursuing in earnest with Bornish. Um, but as restrictions relaxed, we were able to undertake some really extensive testing with some of our toughest critics, so that's primary school and secondary school kids. They don't like it they will tell you and if something's not working they will also tell you so that was really really useful they really captured their information uh, their, their imagination they really enjoyed going inside the houses seeing the mummies they like the graphics and, and they said the best that was going inside the houses and finding artifacts so that 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 sort of sense of adventure and sense of the beaten track self self-directed adventure and self-directed use of, of various interpretive media has been really interesting and you can see them here using it at the school. So they're, they're all looking at Bronze Age roundhouses, but obviously we can't see that. They're all running around and looking at the mummified dogs and the gold rings and various things. And that's the teacher on the left hand bottom, who's not there, she's just her stomach getting fully immersed and, and looking at them through his phone screen. Um, and we continue to work really closely. This is Skull Balvanic, the pupils of Skull Balvanic, you can see here. Uh, they'll be nominating the seventh and final site for the, the app, which will be located in Ben Becula, where they're based. Um, and, and we also work with the, the US Community Archaeology Group. We're we'll, we'll working with them a lot more. We've, we're, we're going to be doing some 3D uh, photogrammetry of the uh, assemblage from one of our other sites, Pogonan, for the end of the year, um, and doing some 3D printing of some artifacts as well. But also, um, we worked with the Castle College UHI music students who composed uh, some bespoke project called About Time. So just working with as many different um, voices and audiences as possible has been really valuable. One of my favourite pictures, this is EFM during one of the testing sessions. She's at Hal in there, peering through the doorway of the roundhouse. You can see that gold ring there. Sometimes it's quite challenging to find because it's quite small. So. 
um, and, and just a nice picture they drew us just again showing that they understand the technology better than any of us they're just top pros at this sort of thing so it's been really valuable working with them and as, as well as working with the schools we've, we've done this really extensive and really useful testing process prior to the launch um, user testing with over 50 people I think a great deal more than 50 actually uh, spanning various audience groups visitors young families older audiences uh, children and young people and getting them to doing a lot of user observations of sending them off to use this this first version of the app and, and watching how they how they use it and, and then then feeding back to us quite a detailed way we were actually able to then implement prior to launch a lot of this feedback so their participation did truly shape the app and will continue to do so uh, as we release future updates and iterations as well and here are just some quotes from that. Uh, they're overwhelmingly positive and praising in particular things like the, the immersive nature of the AR. That works superbly, it brings it to life um, and it leaves no trace. That's really important for us um, is that it does leave no trace uh, unlike some of the other um, elements of heritage manipulation, be that reconstructions of buildings, which have a significant maintenance um, obligation, uh, also um, impacting on our quite fragile landscapes as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, that this one saying after we finished the app, we played around the site pretending to be the inhabitants of the roundhouses. It prompted imaginative play. And I think that's really important as we think about behavior change and how people remember and, and, and engage with archaeology beyond the use of the app and engage with archaeological sites. So it really captured their imagination there. And I'll just uh, move on to some reflections now. So we, we launched in July 2019. Oh, no, God, that was two years ago, 2021. That was, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we, we launched this summer about halfway through the tourist season. So a lot more to capture there. But we've had over a thousand downloads since then. And some people are spending up to 28 minutes using the app at Hallen. So really significant implications there for stop and spend and how long people are spending at archaeological sites and, and looking at them and exploring them. Um, so, so really important there for, for when we think about people spending longer or heavy and way longer using this heritage infrastructure as well. And then within the app, being signposted to different places as well. So as part of the map interface, we also signpost to other archaeological sites, signpost to the restaurants, uh, shops and heritage hubs as well. Um, and then in terms of content use, so we're able to get a lot of this initial analytical data and there'll be a lot more as we continue uh, watching new updates and, and looking at it but initial analytical data just from the last couple of months it uh, has, has been that people are spending more time on elements of the of the site and of the reconstruction than others so the northernmost house is the most popular that's one of the mummies so that might be why but also is the nearest to the qr code people are probably spending the most time in there something that we've we've reflected on now looking back is that possibly we have too much content we've told too many stories and that's us getting excited about all the stories we think need to be told so there's a lot to reflect on there about what how much people actually need and i think you're, you're either the person that looks at every single little um, note display on a museum or you just want to look at a few things uh, so that's something to reflect on going forward so possibly too much content another really interesting reflection and, and element that's come out of this is that in general when we when we've done surveying of the users people prefer the more illustrative styles they prefer the animations and, and and the more creative presentations of that archaeological data the things that seem to be least popular are actually the 3d models the the, the, the photogrammetry and those those very realistic uh, 3d models so uh, i think there's something there to think about in terms of understanding priorities and interests but also just in a, in a broader sense um whether that can be reflected in the heritage field more generally so we, we create a lot of cute 3D models just now, and, and for our audience in particular, that's not always the biggest draw. So something just to think about going forward, I think, in, in the broader context. And I think what's really come to light as well is the importance of shared experiences here. I think having such a visual, um, a, a really visual ex uh, presentation of heritage has meant that there's lots of opportunity here for shared experience. There's been some great social media posting, and you're able to take a selfie if you want in front of the roundhouses. Uh, and of your friends there as well um, and, and most people when we observe how they're using the app is that they'll share a screen they won't all have their own devices they prefer to, to share a device and, and look at it together and talk about what they're seeing and point each other in different directions uh, so, so it's been a really nice way of, of, cap of capturing people's imaginations and also capturing some of people's app as well and that highlighted a lot of positives but i wanted to quickly highlight and reflect on some of the challenges that we faced 
uh, and many of these are inherently linked to the fact that we are really pushing the limits of technology and its capabilities just now. We've been extremely ambitious uh, about what we want to achieve and this has been met with real determination by our fantastic developer team. They've been brilliant in addressing everything we, we, we wanted and, and trying to implement that as much as possible despite its techno the technological challenges we face. So that's things like connectivity in rural areas and use of 4G and, and most notably the time consuming alignment process. So that's the process by which we ensure that the Bronze Age roundhouse reconstruction sits directly on top of the footings of the roundhouse. They're not floating away over there. They're sitting where they're supposed to be. So that's truly uh, an interesting experience and not quite immersive. But it turns out I thought that would be quite simple, but it turns out that's a logistical challenge. So I, I, I can't praise our developers enough for doggedly pursuing that and ensuring it works. Um, all, and, and then maintenance wise, although it leaves no trace on the landscape, the technology isn't without its maintenance obligations. And there's this constant consideration in our minds as we go forward and look beyond the lifetime of our funding about how we're going to ensure that these digital assets that have been created can still be used in the next sort of 10 years or, or, or beyond as well. So maintenance is a really important issue that doesn't go away because you've selected a digital solution. And finally, I just wanted to touch quickly on concepts of authenticity versus experience. This has been really interesting for us again in terms of research implications. As archaeologists, this is something we're often very concerned about is authenticity and what we think is authentic and how we think people use spaces. And I think there's been a real tension there between our desire for what we perceive to be authentic and creating what's actually more important, which is a valuable experience for users. Um, of, of the app and that soon became clear and it's, it's been a really interesting process. And um, in very basic terms, I just wanted to highlight this picture because it shows both uh, options for heritage interpretation that are now available at Cahallon. And in very basic terms, I suppose we've upgraded, we've got that juxtaposition there between the old and the new uh, interpretation options. And it, it takes what we're doing essentially beyond that information panel and what we're trying to do here is promote active engagement rather than passive engagement with these sites, rejecting some, some more energy and more vitality into these sites uh, and encouraging people not only to stand at the interpretation board, you can see I warned that the, that little bit it has, has become there from you standing at the interpretation board, but go beyond the interpretation board and seeing people sort of duck down to get into the roundhouses and, and really get involved and, and get into those, those spaces has been, uh, has been really exciting. Um, and then going forward, this is just a proof of concept for us, and we're confident that this is, is a fantastic solution for us here in US, and I think the, the wider Western Isles and beyond as well. And we pull this out, and, and I think it's just the beginning, really, for us with, with this technology. And I'll just finish by taking a moment to thank our partners. I think Becky's already listed them, so, so I won't go over them, but just to thank all our partners, our, our collaborators as well, and all our stakeholders. And if you do want to download the app, it's available now. It's free to download on Android and iOS. Um, and those are our social media platforms and our email addresses if you'd like to get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Maggie. Sorry, Maggie. I just might add in before we finish, if that's right, Ems. I just thought I might go back to our original screen just to show yeah. where the other sites are. Because uh, yeah, sure. on slide 11, I've just got one more thing to say. It's my bad for not having said this before. But um, as uh, as I think we've touched upon, the, uh, these, there are there are a number of other sites. So this is the first screen that you'll get, and Emily I think has given us a really fantastic overview of what's happening at Hallen. Um, and the next site up here, which is um, uh, Hallen, is here, and the next site up, which is at Bornish. Um, but just to make it clear that we we are going to be creating um, augmented reality experiences around seven of these sites, all located on the Hebridean Way. Um, that we're telling two stories here, really. In South Uist, um, the sites on the Hebridean Way are all on the Macca. So the stories are all about how people have negotiated um, these kind of specific environments and how they've eked out living in these places. Um, uh, but then as we move up into North Uist, we're telling a slightly different story, which is about living on the water. So we've got these two sort of different themes going on. Um, in South Uist, the other thing to point out, which is really nice and convenient, is that most people walk the Hebridean Way, we've, um, we've, been, um, we've been told, uh, from south to north, and conveniently, our sites lie in chronological order, which is really handy. <laughs> Um, so we start off right down here at Andorlin, looking at a Neolithic site. Then people all move up to Hallam, which is Bronze Age. We've got our um, Iron Age site around 
roughly around here, if you can see where my cursor is. Um, uh, oh, sorry, actually roughly about there, which is Kildonan, um, and then ending with Bornish, which is a Norse site. Um, and, and again, our sites in North US are these islet sites. We've got one here at um, Dunan Speaker, which is medieval, and an Iron Age site, Doom Talk, well, uh, here, uh, uh, here. And the final site, as Ems has already said, that working with our fantastic STEM groups at the local schools, once they've had a chance to sort of see all the amazing things that we're able to do with the technology, we're, we're going to hand it over to them and they will get to pick the site, the archaeological site on the Hebridean Way to create. So I just thought I'd end with just highlighting what's to come. You know, this, this is where we're at, but also lots more exciting stuff to come. Sorry, Raggy, now I'll, I'll hand back to you. Oh, how exciting. Congratulations. This is fantastic. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of questions in the chat already and I've also upgraded my, our colleague Sarah Jane to panellists. So, um, uh, I'll start with the questions in the chat. And the first one is from Susan Torrance, who asks, do you have targets for expectations of increased visitor numbers to sites? And how will it be promoted in mainstream tourist marketing of the US? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I think I might have said um, earlier on in the talk that um, visitor, uh, Visit Scotland survey indicates that only about 7% of people um, coming to the Western Isles are uh, site archaeology is their main reason. So we're, we're hoping to increase that by 50%. That, that's our target. And I'm feeling pretty confident about that at the moment, given that we've got some really excellent downloads at the moment. In terms of promoting it, um, uh, you know, we're obviously linked in with the Hebridean Way. The Hebridean Way team um, are, are partners officially with the project, and um, we've got lots of mechanisms for sort of reaching out to tourists um, and, and getting that information across to them. Connectivity is an issue that Emily's mentioned is a challenge for us because in lots of these places you don't have uh, 4G when you're there. So we really need to reach out to people before they come, uh, ideally before they come to US to get them to download it in advance. And once it's downloaded, you not need to have a signal when you're there. Uh, once it's downloaded, you're able to then open that and trigger that. On. That's great. Um, got a question from Michael Pereira. Um, with the recently announced metaverse, which is a speculative future iteration of the internet made up of persistent shared 3D virtual spaces, including the entire spectrum of augmented reality. So that's the metaverse. Do you think this will enhance your project and allow remote attendance to the site for those unable to travel in person? I think that's a really good question. Um, and I'm really delighted that you also defined metaverse for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's a really interesting question. We've, we've made the decision quite early on in this project that you had to come to US to really unlock all of that, that um, the mixed media aspects to it, in particular the, the AR element. And, and, and I think for some people that's a challenging challenging aspect to the project and its output but I think we really stick by that because what it's what we really wanted to see with this project um, you know for our own sake but also for lots of our project partners like the Corlia it's about bringing people to US it's about bringing people to these landscapes um, what we have with the mixed media exhibition is the opportunity to to bring parts of that story out to encourage people to come back in but i think really it, we are very keen that this isn't a project that enables people to engage with the archaeology entirely remotely it's about place-based understanding and place-based experience enhanced by virtual reality and, and augmented reality um so, so that's that's where we are with that and i know that some people find that a challenging concept but i think that's where we're quite determined that yeah. that's how it works. And I've got a comment here from Joanne Machin. Oh, it disappeared. Oh, there it is. This is just fabulous and would be amazing to expand this technology use and expertise out across the UHI. Couldn't agree more, Joanne. Now, Sue Dyke says, fantastic work. Can't wait to revisit the site and try the app. Is there any scope to augment the landscape as well as the buildings from paleo environmental data? Or is that a conscious decision not to, for the same reasons the sites aren't peopled or animaled? Oh, yeah, so you could forest it, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that's, not, that's not what we've done for, for Holland. Um, 
because we think actually the landscape is probably not completely, but not too dissimilar uh, is today, not completely, but roughly the same. But yeah, so one of the sites we're doing is Andorlin, which is a Neolithic site, and there we will be using paleoenvironmental data and focusing more on the landscape rather than the site uh, for, for that one. And we will be uh, re reforesting and, and, and expanding out that coastline using that paleoenvironmental data. And also possibly um, we, the, the site for Ben Beckville isn't totally set in stone yet because we're working on the, the on that with the pupils at Skull Wildlife, but one of the sites that's been floated is the submerged Neo uh, Mesolithic and Neolithic woodland at Linnipet. Uh, and, and there again, we've got lots of rich paleoenvironmental data um, for that that we can use to reconstruct some of those, those landscapes. Neil Ackerman's asking, amazing to see the buildings made into three dimensions. Just wondering if the augmented reality models also be access can be accessed without actually being on the site. Yeah, I think you answered that one already. Just now, that's that, that's a UIST um, sort of special. That's a, a UIST exclusive, I should say. So yeah, you, you have to be in, in UIST to, to do that, but always really happy to chat about our experiences with re those reconstructions and use of space and things like that. Neil is also wondering about the um, the uh, increased footfall, if there's been any issues with increased footfall in the sites themselves, especially if people are being guided along certain routes, doorways, etc. Does this cause hotspots or erosion? Yeah, that's again, really, really good question. It's something we've had to address quite early on with our, our main fund as Natural and Cultural, uh, sorry, uh, Nature Scott, the Natural and Cultural Heritage Fund that they they're, they're all about those fragile landscapes and how we best uh, mitigate against that. that um, what you know, one of their aims is increased footfall on these sites, but then how do we mitigate against that in these very fragile, particularly in the fragile macro landscapes, uh, these sand landscapes? And we work very closely with our Western Isles archaeologist, Kevin Murphy. Uh, we, we, we do a lot of monitoring of, of these sites, so we will be able to hopefully monitor any, any impacts of increased footfall over time. Yeah, I was going to mention Kevin. Yeah. Right. I, I didn't quite understand when you were saying that you can go under doorways and into houses. Do you have to be in the exact spot where the house was archaeologically, or can you be a few yeah. meters away? Uh, no, you you because it's all triggered by. So basically, the developers had to come and do some really extensive alignment exercises to ensure that those houses sit directly on the footings of the houses. So um, they, I mean, for the testing, we, we were able to bring the brown houses to the to the playground, for example, at the schools. But but now you you have to be there. You have to scan that QR code, and then that, that by by the wonders of augmented reality and various technologies uh, that that's, that's their sort of speciality, you are able to directly engage with go through the door, and you're going through that augmented reality door, and you sort of the augmented reality wall. They should be placing exactly where they were. One of one of the ways that we can tell when we've been observing people using the app, one of the ways that we can tell that it's working properly for them and that people are engaging in it is as we're standing a little bit further away watching. Um, obviously, we can't see what they see. They're obviously seeing it through their phone. But when we see when we, we're able to view people crouching down to get under the slightly low, low doorways, first of all, we know that obviously the alignments work. We know that it's in the right place, but also it's an indication that people are engaged enough with the with this augmented reality environment that we put them in, that actually they're, they're bothered about banging their heads. Um, and that that always uh, pleases us to see that. Yeah, and there was also one, one of the really uh, the interesting aspects and, and really important aspects of these excavations that they were able to do a lot of spatial analysis of where deposits were on the floor. So again, with Hallam, what we've been able to do is place all those triggers, to place the mummies, place the gold ring exactly where they were discovered archeologically. So there's that extra layer there of understanding where exactly these things were found. Wow, it's true immersion. I've got a question there from DJ McIntyre. It says, as someone who lived very close to the site of the wheelhouse at Kilfedar, is there evidence that there are many more sites? And how much do researchers use local knowledge to locate perhaps new sites for an archaeological question rather than the technology? Oh, tons. Just there's, there's absolutely tons. The resource on, on that whole stretch of Macha is, is unreal. And a lot of it we do know about, but a lot of it is built down. And my neighbor, for example, Prof's there, and he, he tells me uh, 
sometimes need to be fine to things that I'm not entirely sure I already know about on the historic environment record, for example. So there's still a lot of knowledge there, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a huge amount there. So part of the idea for us thinking about these mapped landscapes and these bumps and lumps is that as archaeologists, when we walk along these, these landscapes, what we're seeing is a really, really busy place and, uh, you know, a place full of lots of prehistoric, for example, activity. And I think that um, if, if something, if through this project, we can kind of recreate that for other people, not just on the sites that we choose to recreate, but if, for example, you know, people are walking along the Maka in other places and, and thinking about these reconstructions and um, and starting to view it in archaeological terms, I think that would be a real um, achievement. Yeah, yeah that, it's about lump and other or yeah. about another hall and, and yeah. Yeah, at, at, at Kilfeder and Kilgonan are those more wheelhouses just nestled in that landscape. And if, uh, yeah, if we can try and convey that through this project, that would be excellent. Yes, it would. Now, Lisa Christensen is asking, I can see the involvement of Gaelic is really important in connecting people with the landscape. Has there been any scope in including folklore and local legend into the app? Was, what is the perception of the local communities? Um, yeah, there's, there's been loads of scope for that, and that's something we've already been able to implement at, at Hallen um, with, 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 the, um, with the audio in particular. So our researcher, Liam Prowse, who, who, uh, who, who works with so yes, he, for that in particular, he works with uh, a tradition bear named Bob Hallen, a storyteller, who, who tells the story of the Stuart, which is the host of the dead, uh, and that's a story directly associated with Hallen and with the place name, and, and being able to implement that into a, a, the understanding of, of place beyond the, what we're talking about, the Bronze Age has been really valuable. So that is something we've already been able to implement and we'll continue to do so because there's so much richness there. And we, for each one, he's, he's been able to produce a shopping list of, of different options because there are just so many options there for things that we could implement in terms of folklore, place name, legend, song. It's, it's kind of endless, really. I'm sure Sarah Jane was faced with many of those choices too in developing these and Magnus way up do you want to come in here uh, Sarah yeah I will actually thought so that's very good thank you Raggy because I was trying to type a question and my typing's terrible <laughs> so I will stop typing I just want to say thanks so much to both of you it's really fascinating to hear about what you've been doing and it's so much of it resonates with what um, I've been involved in with the St Magnus Way which is a, a pilgrimage route that's been developed in in Orkney in recent years and we were faced with kind of similar dilemmas and discussions about resources and of course I come from the same standpoint as you do um authenticity was hugely important to me um and also because i get so passionate and excited and interested in the places i wanted to tell everything <laughs> about a place and one of the things i've had to learn as well as, as you were mentioning is too much information can also be an issue and i think your digging deeper option is a, a really good thing to do and what we've ended up doing with the saint magnus way um, from the outset, we had a sort of tiered approach so you can select what you want to do. And I think given the participant or the visitor that that opportunity to choose how much they want to engage is a really good thing. And we've had a lot of good feedback um, on that as well. We had similar issues of connectivity and, and started off using Bluetooth um, as a means of triggering. But that didn't work and now we're, we're doing something similar to you um, because our connectivity has got better over the past few years um, but I can appreciate the difficulties and issues that you've overcome and it just looks fantastic and I think being tied into the Hebridean way as well is another way that hopefully will help support the legacy of your work going forward because it is part of that larger overarching tourist facing um website and and route um i guess the one thing i find really interesting is your decision to keep it to being site accessed um because it's the opposite of what we're doing with the st magnus way in that a lot of what we're trying to do is create a virtual route for people who are unable to come to orkney to access that way um, so we're at the moment developing a virtual St Magnus Way and as you were talking it's just made me think about um, have we actually thought enough about what we're doing and why we're doing that and whether there ought to still be certain elements that can only be accessed if you're there um, but we've 
also included those different voices. I thought it was really important that the audio should be as much as, as possible. We've got Arcadians um, voices involved in that, children's voices, um, so that somebody using the app doesn't just hear um, one voice, but they hear multiple voices telling different stories. But again, obviously, as you know, it's difficult, isn't it, to decide how much to tell and how how complex to make a story? Do you tell multiple narratives? Do you tell a single? So um, I, I guess I don't really have a question. I just have just how much it resonated, I think, and to congratulate you on what you're doing. And it's a very good excuse for me to have to now come to US and actually access these things because I've never been. <laughs> Yeah, we often have this conversation so don't they say, oh, you've still not been. <laughs> I think there's so many things that you said there that are yeah, really interesting. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think I was just going to comment on the, the sort of profiling. I think, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the types of visitors we think are coming. And I think, you know, to begin with, sometimes it's hard to imagine that there are people out there who don't want to know everything about these sites. And you go, oh, yeah, not everyone wants every little bit of detail. But I think one of the beauties of the technology is that we don't, don't have to force everybody to have it all and actually there are different layers and we've talked about you know if there's a take-home message for the types of visitor who's going to be here for just five minutes like what do we want them to walk away with compared to what's the what's the experience going to be of someone who's there for half an hour and then goes back to their bnb or back to their house or whatever and reads more and wants to find more and trying to make sure that we've got something that works for all these different people at the same time it's not completely overloading the app with too much information so getting that balance is, is quite hard um, and the other thing I was just to say, I think it's it's really interesting what you say about you're creating a you're almost doing the opposite in terms of making it available to others. It's been it's been you know it's a difficult decision for us to make, mm -hmm. and every time we talk about the project, we get questions about it. Um, and it is a, it is a hard one, and I suppose I, I still still stand by it, but I think it's it's got to get that balance right. And, yeah. and I think we're in two very different regions as well, aren't yeah, we, in terms true. of priorities and in terms of footfall and, and desired footfall or maybe less desired footfall for. So there's a lot to consider there. And um, I think it's, it is a nice idea to have something that's exclusively a, a sort of rewards for, for exploring some of these landscapes. And I just think as, as we move into this new sort of COVID world, that the offering, the virtual offering is just going to increase. And I don't think we're ever going to be short of heritage, whether that's assets, landscape sites that, that are going to be available online. So I think we just wanted to point that a little bit. I think perhaps when we're at the stage where we have to, when we've got a serious footfall issue in Europe, yeah. it's just, we're not, we're just nowhere near that at the moment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's quite different. But it's really interesting to hear that you're having similar discussions mm -hmm. and like, I, I think, I think it's interesting though, that you know, in Orkney, we have a lot of tourists already. <laughs> so um, part of our consideration is offering it, you know, remotely um, alleviates some pressure on tourism at certain times of year too. So we're actually at the kind of opposite ends of the, the spectrum when it comes to tourism. So you can see why we're both doing what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And maybe, you know, in a few years time, if this project's too successful, we might have to flip it and be like, yeah. okay, no more people, no more people. it's only yeah, virtual. It's only virtual. <laughs> I'm really interested in the immersive aspect of it. Um, and my favorite slide was the one that said that children in the response group had been observed in, engaged in creative play that was inspired by this. I, I think that's the best result for me. And it Thank shows you. that this augmented reality is just another form of immersion and that it connects with other things that people are doing, such as building replica round houses and replica Viking ships and long houses and, and uh, dressing up and reenacting and uh, playing in different ways. So this is a very playful way of letting people engage with the archaeology. Uh, I agree. That's one of our favourite comments and our favourite observations from the whole testing process was that. And they've made a sort of a little, they've made their own little hearth in another area of the site and they've they've really taken that beyond the app after they, they, they stopped looking at it. And there are quite a few examples of that. Uh, and I think anything that, 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 that they leave with beyond what they've seen on the screen is, is really valuable. I think the other one yeah. that really um, works, uh, really excites me was the, the, the Ian, who he's, after he's been using the app for half an hour or so and watched all of the, um, you know, I think it's a seven-year-old kid, then um, 
came back and told us the story of uh, unprompted story of the Hallam um, mummies, yes. uh, and and that felt like that was some really successful engagement. Win. Yeah, a real win. Yes. Um, we're going to finish soon, but I'm just going to read out one last question and two comments that have come in. Um, Sinead Marshall says, fantastic project. I'd love to ask what skills one would need to have or develop to create this. And I suppose uh, you've been collaborating with some very skilled people too, and people did bring different skills to the table. Yeah, it's been really enriched by the fact that it is so multidisciplinary and multi-partner. So we've got a fantastic developer. So within Heal Interactive that we, we, we work with on the tech side, we've got the developers, but also the animators, um, the, the 3D modelers, the, the infographic artists. So there's a huge team within that, that creative side already, as well as the really the hardcore tech and augmented reality side of things. And then we've got um, lots of research skills coming in. So Jake, our project researcher, uh, with more traditional research skills of mining those those monographs and being able to take that information and communicate that um and and so there's lots of different things going on within that that all come together to create that and can't profess to have that entire skill set as, as a team here in-house we have had to bring that out but i think that's what's really enriched the project is that multi-stakeholder and the last couple of comments were one from Kim Thorne, who says, one foot in the past, one in the future. How wonderful. Thanks so much to you all. This has been a very interesting presentation. Very DJ McIntyre says, I'm really enjoyed good. the presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, I'll just add a huge big thank you and a round of applause. Now you can't hear everybody clapping, so I'll have to clap for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure we're all applauding in our individual homes here. That has been absolutely fascinating. And like Sarah Jane, I now also want to come to you. Next. Anyone come, we'll give you a, we'll give you a demo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you so much and have a great thank weekend. Thank you for inviting us and organizing this. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been fab. Thank you.